Hi class. So for this session, we're going to talk about uh, a topic that gets wider in scope. Uh, as we go out through the semester, the, the themes get wider and wider and wider in some sense, till at the end we get to basically the, the planet itself and environmental questions. So for this session, we're going to talk about Zoopolis, uh, which I base off of a reading uh, by Jennifer Walsh, which is your reading for today. And I'm going to say right off the bat that it is one of the hardest readings of the semester. You really have two readings that are quite challenging, quite demanding. Um, the posthumanist read reading, which is coming up, and then this one. Um, it, it's just very academic in tone, um, very um, finely argument, uh, uh, argumented in a very like uh, uh, exacting way. And so it can be somewhat laborious to read, but I, I have to tell you that it's quite re rewarding and it's really rich with ideas. Um, um, and it, it, it's very ambitious as an essay. So for this lecture, <clears throat> we're gonna talk about uh, the essay and I'm gonna try to help unpack some of the, some of the key themes in the essay um, to help you when you go read it. So uh, I advise, I'm gonna tell you this on the website, of course, because you have already you, you would have uh, already clicked on this video, but I, I advise watching the video first and then going to the reading because then I think it'll be it'll be helpful. And throughout, I'm going to intersperse examples from art, but also from culture um, and politics and, and and wider wider questions. So first, let's just understand exactly what Walsh is trying to do with her essay here, which again is very ambitious. Uh, from the broadest scope, from the, the bird's eye view, her essay is about reimagining urban theory, so the ways in which we understand cities and city planning. Um, try, try to reimagine urban theory away from an anthropocentric conception of the city and, sur and its surroundings. Anthropocentric might be a new word for you, but it's an, it's an important one to learn, not only for this class, but just for life in general. Anthropocentric means that the human is at the center of the world, that the ways in which the world is conceived, in this case the city, really only is interested in the well-being of the human. That's what anthropocentric means. So anthro is always uh, human, and for the longest time it would have been understood as man, quote-unquote, but anthropocentric means that human is at the center of, of, of interest. And so she says we want to reimagine the city away from simply thinking of, uh, thinking of it as a space for and by humans. And she argues that this will then re-enchant urban life, that the city will become uh, re-enchanted, like more magical, uh, um, uh, less violent, more interesting, uh, more convivial, and that this is going to lead to broader social well-being. So you can see already this is a very ambitious claim uh, and one that we can we can dispute, one that we can work with, and one that we can challenge and we should challenge uh, because the stakes are so high. Um, she even goes on to argue even more ambitious claims that thinking in this de-anthropocentric way, thinking of the city away from a human-centered thing, uh, and allowing other forms of life to dwell and to thrive within the city, that this will also in some ways fight uh, racism, sexism, and classism, uh, other forms of discrimination. So classism, you know what racism and sexism means, discriminating according to race or, or gender, um, or sexual um, 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 uh, or sexuality. But classism, maybe you don't know quite as well, but class, here we mean, let's say, poor class, working class, middle class, upper class, uh, 1%, 99%, that sort of thing, right? That uh, the ways in which the lower classes are discriminated and persecuted, uh, having a zoopolitical conception of the city will in some ways fight this. So for me, this all sounds really wonderful. This is uh, in in my worldview, this is what I want the, the what what I want cities um, and and human communities to be like to have respect to allow other forms of life to thrive, not only non-human animal life but also plant life, uh, trees and forests and that sort of thing. Um, but I, I'm also very interested in in in, in fighting racism, sexism, classism, uh, classism, all these things that that are um, that that lead to inequality are based in inequality and lead to various forms of violence and discrimination. This is, this is, this is what I want. Um, and I think that there is something to her argument, 
but it's also very, very ambitious. And so um, when, when you're reading the essay, I want you to keep, keep, keep in mind how ambitious it is and keep your critical faculties about you and try to find ways in which, wait, maybe she's making some presumptions here that aren't fully thought through, uh, which is a good thing to do. So even if you're on board with her, her argument, and this is the case with anything in, in, in life, to be honest, the more you critique it, the more you pick at it, the more you analyze it, the better the argument is going to be, and the better you'll be able to make it, right? So keep, keep that in mind as we're going through this, and eventually as you go and read the, the essay. So I'm going to go through a few themes for you that I think are important to pull out. These aren't the only themes, and they might not be the themes that you focus on, but I think these are the big ones. And the first one is the idea of this ethics of caring, this attention to codependency, of all of us being dependent in some ways, uh, whether it's a family, whether it's a state, whether it's a city, whether it's friends, uh, whether it's nature itself. Um, and kinship. So kinship is an important term in this essay. Kinship is simply, you know, um, the ways in which you see yourself in other, uh, in other forms of life, um, in other humans, but also um, in, in non-humans, in non-human animals. So forming kinships, forming bonds. Um, that, that, are, that are in some ways inherent um, to the ways in which we live. So if anybody has a companion species out there, I, have a, um, I live with a cat um, who's definitely bothered my lectures before, but for the animal studies class, it's fitting. Um, he's, he's, a, he's a non-human animal that, that I live with. Uh, he's dependent on, on me, but there are some ways in which I'm dependent on, on him in more subtle ways, right? So this is, this is the, 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 the ideas of kinship that she's working with, that Wolch is working with. And I think this is one of her big, biggest claims. She says, we have to recognize that human beings are embedded in social relations and networks with people that are both similar and different. Um, on which everybody's welfare depends, right? So this is kind of getting away from a very, uh, what would be called like a neoliberal conception of the human community, where everybody is atomized, everybody is out uh, on their own, uh, but realizing that communities, that, that the cities and that the world itself, everything is interdependent and everything um, um, affects everything else to certain degrees, and that we are uh, uh, dependent on a number of things that maybe we don't even know um, like bees pollinating our, 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 our fruits and vegetables, um, that this is an important idea to think through, this, 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 uh, this idea of being codependent and this idea of kinship. Um, and she says that the, the realization of this kinship allows for difference, um, to see that some of, the, some of the parts of the world that, we're, that we care about, that we're dependent on and they're dependent on us, that we have kinship, are both similar and different from us. Um, and in her argument, this works both within the human community, there, 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 um, that are humans, that there, there, there are cultures and ethnicities that are different from, from the one you've been embedded in, the one you've grown up in. Um, so there are differences, but of course there are, there are more commonalities um, between humans than, than anything else. But she argues that this kinship, this play of difference and, and sameness of being alike and being dislike also works when it comes to relating to non-human animals. So like my cat or a pig or um, a cow or a dog, we are, or certainly primates, um, chimpanzee or you know, great apes and that sort of thing, bonobos, there is, an in, there, there is quite a bit of, of, of similarities in the ways we, we, we live, um, which is why we can in some ways communicate. This is why, um, uh, we have empathy with each other. This is why, um, while we can't speak to each other through um, through English, um, although higher level primates can sign language and they can use symbols, we can communicate in other ways. So there are there are ways in which our worlds connect. But an ant or a bat or um, um, a tuna swimming in the ocean very, uh, very different, uh, uh, or more different than, say, a primate um, or, or, um, or, or, or a dog that, that you might live with, right? But for, for Walsh, there are still um, similarities to be gleaned, even from, um, from a fish out in the ocean. I mean, from an evolutionary perspective, that's actually definitely, definitely true. So uh, it's as if her argument is dependent on this whole network of 
of similarities and differences within life, but also an attention to that and a, uh, an attention to being caring about the things that we are dependent on and are dependent on us and conceiving of social space as a form of, of kinship. So that's like her broadest argument. And what's more fun here, um, bear with me with the more theoretical stuff uh, in, in her essay, but what's more fun and interesting is to actually go through examples to see how this works in real life. So I could bring tons and tons of examples for you when it comes to this idea of, of caring for others and sometimes non-human others, of this idea of codependency uh, and of this idea of, of kinship. So here's uh, Bretagne, who was the last living dog who was one of the first responders uh, on 9-11. Um, and this is a really bittersweet scene. It's very beautiful. She's being uh, taken into, um, I think, the, the, the vet. And she's being saluted because she's, uh, this, is her, the end of her, this is the end of her life. Um, so in some ways, this is like a ceremonial memorial for the dog, uh, almost like a, a, a burial. And so the fact that a dog will get this level of respect shows you that that dog has entered into the human community has entered into a state of kinship with these officers uh, that's that's very similar uh, and in many ways uh, equal to the kinship and the type of ceremonies that we would have for a fellow human officer or, or worker, right? Um, it's really well known that these dogs, there are a lot of dogs at ground, ground Zero that went looking for people, and I think I talked about this in a previous lecture, and it was a very difficult job for them. Um, and so um, this this is a, a really touching a really touching scene, and I think is very evocative of this idea of kinship between a human and a non-human animal. Um, there is also the phenomenon of of therapy animals, which also attest to this ways in which we have kinship and we're dependent on other animals that they actually provide us. Uh, uh, something, emotional well-being. And this is well known when you pet your cat or your dog. There are endorphins. There are things that, that um, there's oxyto oxytocin. There are chemicals, uh, hormonal changes in your body that, that give you well-being, that make you quite physically happy. Um, and so it makes sense that a lot of different animals are used within, within uh, care uh, and, and and, and sites of um, uh, situations of, of therapy, like donkeys will be taken in to hospitals so, good, so kids can pet them, uh, all sorts of different uh, ther therapy animals. They show that we have a certain amount of kinship with, with other beings, uh, that they connect with us, um, even if they're uh, a duck. And this is a well-known story by an Iraq veteran who had, who had PTSD. He lived in Ohio, and he had ducks that he raised and he, they, they were therapeutic for him. He didn't raise them for, for food. He raised them as, uh, as kin, like as, 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 um, as animals that he could care for, and they cared for him because they helped him quite a bit with the traumas that he, he endured in the, the Iraq war with his post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. Um, so again, another lovely example of being attentive to the non-human world as a form of codependency and kinship and caring, right? So this is one of the key ideas in, in her essay. And we'll see this in contemporary art too. I could bring you a lot of different examples, but this is a wonderful artist, Maya Schmecker, she's Slovenian, and she's worked with her dogs in her works, in her installations. This is called canine topology. And what you're seeing is this sort of artificial cave uh, that's lined with used fur. Uh, she was adamant to, to get used fur, uh, fur coats and then reuse them as this um, almost like Neolithic habitation. In the back there, you're seeing this sort of chemistry-like setup. And so what she did is uh, you go into the cave and there was a sensor at the end of the cave. You were sort of like forced to crawl into it. And you would smell uh, a mix of her serotonin, which is, you probably know what serotonin is, a uh, hormone in our brains that, that modulate our, our well-being. She mixed her serotonin with the serotonin of her dogs uh, together. And the smell of that serotonin, the serotonin itself was put into a perfume and you would go in and you would, you would smell. So you were basically smelling her serotonin and her dog's serotonin. And here is the artist inside the cave with her two dogs. I love the um, um, cute, little, cute little dogs. Um, and so 
this this is also an instance of this codependency and kinship but at the bodily at the bodily level that's one of the big points of this work so people who have worked on the evolution of the relationship between dogs and humans um, it's been more it can be described more as a type of of mutual domestication where dogs and humans uh, thousands of years ago got together and started to, to oh, their community started to overlap and what happened over time among a number of things is that at the genetic level our serotonin we started to share certain receptors so the happiness hormone in a dog would sync up with a happy happiness hormone in a human which is why we are so good together right this is a long relationship throughout time um, that's based in part on actual genetic kinship um, at the level of, of, of our well-being. So it's a fascinating work and I think, you, I think you can see that it definitely fits within this idea of zoopolis, of the idea of thinking more than simply the human but thinking about the way in which the human and the non-human dwell together, sync up together, have forms of kinship together. It's uh, very important for uh, Wolch's conception of zoopolis. And so there's another way in which to talk about Zupolis in, in, a, in, a in a broader way. Um, and this, in fact, influenced two other um, animal rights theorists, Sue Donaldson and Will Klamicka. They're, they're political scientists. They're political philosophers. I don't assign this reading because it would just be too much for, for an undergraduate class. Um, but in the broadest sense, they were inspired by Wolch's essay, and they wrote a whole book, um, a theory of animal rights based on this idea of zoopolis. And they have a three-tiered system, and I find this to be fascinating, and I really want you to think through this, especially when we're looking at examples and when you're thinking about your own ideas in relation to what we're doing here. They say that there should be a three-tiered system um, within the way we conceive the world and the relationships between humans and animals. One, they say that when it comes to domesticated animals, they've been born, they've been modulated and bred in such a way that they've entered into a state of, of almost complete dependency on us. Um, but of course it's also mutual, right? We're dependent on them. The more and more we're, we, we, we want to think of mutual forms of domestication, not this sort of uh, one-way domestication. So they say that for these domesticated animals, be it so-called food animals, cows, pickens, uh, uh, pigs, chicken, sheep, and so on and so forth, but also what we call pets or companion species, um, all forms of animals, including dogs and cats, and there's overlap between those two. Um, they say that, that these animals sh should be given a type of co-citizenship. They're so tightly knitted within the human community. They're so dependent on us uh, that they should be thought of as, as co-citizens uh, within, within this space, which of course doesn't mean that they, they have the ability to vote in municipal elections or anything like this, but they should have certain rights of citizenship uh, as beings that were born into a world in which they are dependent um, and we are dependent on, on them. Uh, so that's their, their conception of, 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 co of, of domesticated animals, uh, which of course would really change the status of so-called food animals, right? Uh, to become a, a citizen, one of the things is to be protected and not to be harmed. And it would also change our conception of pets, which could no longer be like little animals that are, you know, fashion accessories, right? Uh, that are just stuffed in little handbags and shown around and then uh, maybe neglected or just thrown out when not needed, right? This type of, of, of citizenship might be a powerful um, tool and idea within, within human societies to, to respect the non-humans that are here uh, and unavoidably here, right? So that's one lens. The other lens is to think of denizenship, uh, of, of these denizens that are part of the city but they don't live with us, uh, they're not completely dependent on us. So think of like uh, rats, think of uh, raccoons in the, in, in the park. Think of all these animals that live kind of alongside us uh, and in some ways are dependent on us, but not directly. Um, and it's the same for us. For these animals, they should have like a type of denizenship. So not full citizenship, but a type of denizenship where they have certain rights within uh, the spaces that they live alongside us in, in the city or indeed even in like the rural areas. And then there's a third type, uh, rights of sovereignty for wild animals. So for, these are the species that need nothing to do with us and we don't need anything to do with them. And in some ways they have their own communities, their own packs, 
and they have they have autonomy over their own lives. So these are all those animals out there that um, 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 that that live truly in in the wild. So think of um, hopefully one day we'll have wool, more wolves again. Uh, they were hunted almost to extinction on this on this continent. So wolves living in packs out in the wild. Um, think of coyotes, uh, think of birds of prey, uh, think of bears, think of mountain lions. All these animals that, that are out there um, outside the spaces, most of the spaces where human lives, humans live, and they have their own worlds, they have their own communities, um, and we need to then respect them as having a sovereign, a sovereign space. A sovereign means to have like um, 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 uh, freedom within um, um, within within uh, like a geographical area in this in this case. So a three tiered system, which is really kind of kind of fascinating, which comes out of Walsh's essay. So this is a quote from from um, from her essay, which I think leads directly to this idea of Zoopolis, where she, where Walsh says ultimately the division between wild and domestic has to be permeable. Um, that there are all these different types of animals with all these different types of capacities and behaviors. Um, and all these different types of interactions with people. So some some animals should never interact with people, like a mountain lion, or um, or a grizzly bear. But some animals do interact with people um, um, in sometimes productive ways, right? So it's a very interesting way of conceiving it. And we could we could we could talk about this with certain works of art um, and certain initiatives that we already have in the city, which is what I'm going to do. So first, a very classic canonical work from art history is Joseph Boyes' I Like America and America Likes Me from 1974. And this is a, a complicated performance that he did. Uh, it was a week in a gallery in New York, Green Gallery, where he dressed up almost like as the shaman, um, and he lived with a coyote for the whole week, and he didn't speak to anybody. It was, you could look, you could see into the room, but you couldn't walk into the room. It was him and the coyote together, um, getting to know each other for a week. And this, it, this is more complicated than the way I'm describing it, but this has become a really important work for a lot of artists who who became attentive to animals, a number, including a number of the artists we, we've already talked about in this class. Because fundamentally, the gesture here is boys took uh, a quasi-wild animal, um, a coyote. They do end up in New York City sometimes. This has happened. And he put them, he put this coyote in a really privileged urban setting, namely a gallery, a very upscale gallery, right? Um, and he, he, he gave the coyote a certain amount of cultural visibility, um, and he allowed the coyote to live according to the coyote's need, needs uh, for, that, for that one week. And so this is, in Walsh's terms, a type of zoo, zoopolitical uh, gesture here. He wasn't dominating the coyote. Um, he was living with the coyote and creating a form of kinship with this coyote for that one week for the duration of this of this performance, um, and there are also shades of uh, uh, Native American, Indigenous, or First Nations types of types of, of culture here that Boys is is invoking, uh, maybe as a form of cultural appropriation, but nonetheless, it's still interesting to think that coyotes are incredibly important animals for. Um, for non-Western forms of knowledge, for First Nations, for indigenous peoples that were living here well before uh, the pilgrims came here. Whereas for most Westerners who live here, a coyote is simply a pest or a danger um, or a threat to livestock or something like that, right? So, so Boys is sort of trying to reconceptualize what a coyote is to a more uh, hospitable um, situation. And, and again, in this form of, of kinship between a human and a non-human. And we also see this in, I've seen this recently in New York, um, there's an initiative in New York that's very, you know, if you if you read Walsh's essay and you think, oh my, good, oh my goodness, this is so utopian, there's, you know, there's no way anything like this will ever be um, put, into, put into practice, it's just way too idealistic. Well, I mean, in some ways it is, but in other ways it actually has already happened. So there's an initiative by the city um, to educate people about fellow dwellers in, in New York. Uh, and maybe you've seen these in posters, maybe you've seen these in, in, in various places, but there's a whole initiative for you to know not only, obviously, the humans that you're living with, um, the, what is it, 12 million other humans that are living near you in New York City, 
but there are all these animals in New York City um, that you you sort of want to respect, you want to learn about, and know how to um, know how to uh, uh, navigate. And so, of course, so you have uh, deer, um, and I'm right now upstate in upstate New York, and there I see deer just about every day. Um, coyotes, we just talked about coyotes. Raccoons. Uh, if you go to Central Park at night, you'll, it's very likely that you'll see a, a raccoon. Um, even even hawks. <clears throat> um, we, we definitely have red-tailed hawks in New York City. Um, if you go out to the Rockaways, into the beaches, you'll see all these incredible seabirds, including piking, piping plovers. And if you've ever gone to those beaches, you'll notice that the city has cordoned off certain sections for uh, the... the, the the, the, the sections in the sand where these plovers have, have laid their eggs. And so they make sure not to have humans tread on those eggs. So that's very much along the lines of making space for another species within an urban setting, in this case, an urban beach. So, you know, these are already um, examples of, of, of its modest but zoopolitical understanding of the urban space, which our city has already undertaken. I can also give you an example. This is a really wonderful film called Tokyo Wawa uh, from Japan. And it's all about the ways in which way beyond our conception of nature uh, in the West. In Japan, uh, Japanese culture is definitely influenced quite a bit by Shintoism, which is a type of animist tradition that really respects nature um, um, in, in many ways. And this is still a part of Japanese modern society. And so there are crows in Tokyo and in Japan. The crow is a very important animal in Japanese culture. And I said this in the ethology section, crows are way more smart than you think. Crows are basically as intelligent as a chimpanzee. Um, they're from the corvid family, so really, really intelligent birds. And so they live alongside uh, the people living in Tokyo, in this city. And Tokyo and its human residents, they all make space and they all allow for interactions between uh, crows and, uh, uh, and, and and human city dwellers, right? So let me just show you the trailer. And if you're interested, seek out this, this film because it's a very beautiful documentary. ここの前は確かに公園の中なので、え、少し森で暮らしてるような気分には若干なりますけれども。でもここも大都会の真ん中で。思わない サービスとして提供されてるものだと思ってるんだけれども。私たちがコントロールできない動物、生物もこのようにはたくさんいて、人もそのサムオブデムというかその中の一種類に過ぎない。
fascinating. Um, uh, one of the really fascinating uh, moments in this film, which I've always I've always remembered, it's been years since I've seen it, uh, but it's it's uh, these crows will go and get these nuts that they can't open with their own beaks. Um, they're just too strong. They're too hard to crack, and so the birds will take them to the to the highways, to the roads, and drop the drop the the nuts so that like a big truck or a, you know a car will go over the nut um, and and crack the nut, and then the crow will go and take the nut out of the out of its pod, right? And the people in Tokyo know this. They know that these crows are doing this, and they'll, so they'll purposely try to to go for the nuts and try to crack them while while they're, they're while they're driving. Um, so this shows not only like a form of kinship and connection between the crows and the humans, but also uh, a really savvy bird to be able to do this, right? Um, but but one of the major takeaways here is that in Japanese culture, unlike Western forms of, of culture, where for the longest time in the West, it's been understood that culture and science and history is on one side and then nature is something completely different and we're not in it. For the Japanese, there's no distinction. There's, a, there's very much a blurring between what's quote-unquote nature and what's quote-unquote culture and there's always a, an impulse to remember and to keep in mind that humans are a part of nature and nature is a part a part of us so it's it's, it's very much in line with um, this paradigm of zoopolis that, that uh, Walsh, Walsh is talking about um, and so here's where we get to maybe I think the, the maybe the most ambitious theme of, uh, of, uh, of, of the film um, sorry for the, the buzzing here. Uh, my, my computer heats up a little bit when it's showing videos, so uh, it takes a lot of energy, but it'll, it'll go away in a moment. So the idea of Zupolis as a post-colonial or intersectional critique of economies of exploitation. So we're going to have a whole class on post-colonial theory um, and, the, and the role of animals in the post-colonial. So don't worry too much about this. Um, and as far as intersectional critique, you may have heard this term intersectional before, it comes out of black studies, it comes out of race studies. But to think intersectionally, intersectionally, sorry, that's a mouthful, intersectionally, um, is to think that there are ways in which um, discriminations happen within culture, within society, within politics. But those forms of discrimination are never isolated. They're always part of other intersections. They're always networked with other forms of discrimination. And so one of the key things in this class is that once we get to these larger topics is to see that discriminating when it comes to race and racism, discriminating when it comes to gender, discriminating when it comes to class or caste or position in society, um, discrimination when it comes to species, um, all these forms of dis discrimination within society, culture, politics, and history, there is a way in which they reinforce each other and that at times they intersect. Um, and so this is a really important idea. And Wolch is already talking about these ideas in this essay. So it's a nice sneak peek to our later classes where we talk about post-colonialism and we talk about eco-feminism. Uh, but, she, but she basically says that re-naturalizing the world and re-enchanting the city uh, to include non-humans non and to develop what she calls these webs of kinship and caring with animal subjects. Um, not only will we become more aware of animals that we're normally not aware of in our daily life and in our cityscapes, but we'll also start thinking in a bigger picture political economic way of the structures and the social relations that are in place, not only in cities, but also the ways in which cities uh, fit into like a planetary scale. Um, so this is really ambitious on, on her part. Uh, and she says that to think zoopolitically is a way to curb the contradictory and colonizing politics of, of the West. Uh, that the West will inflict uh, damage or, or violence or discrimination on other parts of, of, of the world. Um, and so here, this is a big idea, but like um, I think the, the most important example of this would be the... Um, would be beef. So the, the taste for, for beef, which of course has been huge in the hamburger culture of the United States starting in the 1950s, and beef is now uh, becoming more and more sought after in the world. This is a huge problem for us. 
um, leaving aside the ethics of, of raising and killing cows before, um, you know, as their adolescents, um, or, you know, in, in the early part of their lives, leaving that aside, uh, for the most part, cows are raised on lands that uh, do three things. One, they, you have pasture land that, that has incursions in uh, natural habitats, so other species are destroyed. So you have biodiversity loss. The biggest would be in the Brazilian Amazon, and 80% of the Amazon deforestation is for cattle, is for beef. Um, so there's that. Then there's also the fact that when these cattle, uh, when these cattle ranching operations go out and, and, and deforest the Amazon, they're not only inflicting damage on, on other species, but there are human communities that are dependent and that live there that are then displaced, and in some cases killed. Um, when you have indigenous activists that try to fight against this large-scale animal industry in the Amazon, they get killed. Right? So we're also talking about human well-being that are in the way of these industries. But then this is everybody involved. Uh, getting uh, deforestation in the Amazon and the raising, the raising of more and more cattle leads to more and more greenhouse gases, which means the more and more global warming, which means we're all affected. Uh, right? So we go from being attentive and careful and caring about, um, in this instance, beef, which will be in restaurants everywhere in New York City, and then sort of pan outward to see, to start thinking, thinking zoopolitically to these larger political economic structures and seeing that that, that stake on the plate is actually uh, part of a much larger political question that involves all of us, right? So that's just one example of Wolch's argument. But she basically says that to think so politically, naturally then you're going to start thinking about these larger political economic structures that lead to violence um, and that lead to um, um, difficult situations for other species in the so-called wild, but also other humans um, who, who are not in the so-called uh, developed, developed world. Um, and in some cases for a lot of humans in the developed world who are, who are poor and precarious. Um, and so I think I've just distilled this part of, of her essay. Um, and there's a way in which to think zoopolitically, she thinks will naturally make people um, uh, think in a more activist way um, and alter sort of the individual perspective and priorities uh, for, for political, political action. So I think that's an important theme to draw out of her essay. And again, probably the most ambitious one uh, by far. And so some examples. Um, this is a really wonderful film, uh, and I'm not going to play. I have the, I have the trailer for you here, but I'm not going to play you the trailer because my uh, it's just, it's going to this is going to go too long, and my computer is going to heat up again. Uh, but I will. You can you can Google this trailer if you're interested. It's it's a really fantastic film, and it's about Baltimore, and it's about the rat population in Baltimore, um, and the way in which the humans in Baltimore interact and live with rats in all sorts of different ways. So it's very much this zoopolitical understanding of the rat and the human in the city. But where this film ties into this question, an economy's exploitation, is that one of the big arguments of the film, and he shows it to you visually, this is the director by Theo Anthony, he shows you that the, the, the rat populations in Baltimore, where there are real problems, um, match up almost perfectly, oh, I'm sorry, match up almost perfectly with the history of redlining in the city. And if you don't know what redlining is, it's important to know. Redlining are, it's a long established, it's no longer legal, but there are ways in which certain politicians can still do it. Certain people in power can still do it. But redlining is, is to discriminate at the level of race, um, uh, financial loans and financial uh, interactions uh, mortgages and this sort of thing, you discriminate a certain population so that effectively they're, they're sequestered to a certain part of the city, which of course will be the poorer uh, part of the city with, with less, less infrastructure and so on and so forth. Um, and so this is very much a history of racism. But in the film, they make an argument that, that this history of racism uh, cohabitates with this history of rats in the city because they basically are all sequestered to live in in the same red line, line districts. Uh, so it's a fascinating film. I highly recommend it. Um, again, I won't play the, the trailer for you, but uh, you, you, uh, you can seek it out and watch the whole film if you, if you have time. 
or just watch the trailer. And there are lots of examples I can I can show you. So this is really horrible. This was the hurricane, um, Hurricane Florence, which was a year ago, which created all this this terrible flooding um, in North Carolina. And North Carolina, I think, is the biggest has has the biggest um, hog farms in in the world. Um, and all these pigs were were basically uh, drowned in the. Um, in, 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 the, in the hurricane. So you think of a, of a natural disaster normally as a, a natural disaster when it comes to uh, to humans, right? And rightly so, right? These, these hurricanes are terrible when they, when they hit uh, communities and cities. And normally it's poorer um, and minorities who are, who are hit the hardest. Uh, but they also hit these non-human populations that are a part of our, uh, of our, of our economy. Um, and so all these pigs, uh, uh, all, the, all these pigs drowned. Um, and again, there's a connection here. It's not simply that you have humans on one side and these pigs on the other. These pig farms are located usually in the poorest communities. And think of the waste, uh, the pollution, and the environmental damage uh, that leads to all sorts of problems for these humans that are living nearby. Um, who, who start to have health problems. The water table is contaminated by feces and by pollution. Um, it's, it, once you start think, thinking zoopolitically, you start to see these connections between the ways in which these non-humans are used and the way in which they affect certain humans and not others, right? Um, so this is another, another really um, a good example. Um, and it's really sad. It's really traumatic. Um, this seems really terrible, but it's nothing compared to what COVID has done to uh, domesticated so-called food animals uh, because the, su the supply chain has been disrupted and f and farmers have to are, are killing animals by 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 the billion uh, by the millions. Uh, they have to call them because they can't sell them. They can't do anything. Uh, and for me, this will sort of betray my perspective on on the matter. But I find it very bizarre to see a, a farmer crying that he had to kill his uh, his animals, when of course the very reason he's raising them is to kill them for food. Uh, so it, it sounds very contradictory, very cognitively dissonant, very bizarre uh, to me. Um, and this is another <clears throat> another term that um, that Walsh uses is that when you start thinking zoopolitically, you start to see these weird contradictions. Like, uh, um, what does it mean for a farmer to cry when he has to call his pigs, uh, but then when he takes them, you know, to the normal operation of taking them to a slaughterhouse so that they get they get rendered. Um, why is that not a moment for, for crying? Um, and actually, for some farmers, it, it, it actually is. Um, so that's an interesting example. And then speaking of COVID, of course, we're still in a pandemic, uh, and it's still very, very difficult uh, right now. Um, COVID itself can be thought in this zoopolitical sense. So we now know, we now know for a little while, um, uh, that, that the, the coronavirus likely came from either a bat body or a pangolin um, in a so-called wet market um, in Wuhan, in, in, in China. Uh, and so this is an example of a species that are, uh, that are trafficked and they're eaten or used in certain ways in, in, uh, in medicine and that sort of thing, um, that then have real connections and real consequences, in this case, for the whole uh, human population on this planet because it ended up unleashing this emergent uh, zoonotic disease, this coronavirus that is COVID-19. COVID and we should make further connections here because uh, the more and more industries like cattle ranching and like other forms of industries like, like palm oil and like uh, timber and that sort of thing, the more they go into nature and, and start dominating and taking over ecosystems, the more humans start interacting with these species that should remain in the wild. They should not be interacting with humans. So bats are carriers of all sorts of viruses. Like they should be uh, living in their own sovereign space. We should not be having interactions with them because terrible things happen. Uh, so this is another really prime example of Zupolis. And I always point this out here because I've seen online, I've seen people say um, that in a very racist sort of way or like very ethno-debasing way, they say like, Oh no! Like these these Chinese people, they eat bats and have pangolins, and it's their fault. Like what, they, they, it's crazy that they eat these things. It's their fault that there's this virus and so on and so forth. In this sort of like really uh, othering sort of racist way, what these people don't understand is that almost every single pandemic or uh, epidemic 
that has happened in the past, well, forever, uh, including the Spanish flu of 1918, which is the worst pandemic ever, um, including bird flu, including swine flu. Um, there was a really bad one in 2009, including um, uh, all sorts of other uh, pandemics. These came from Western industrial animal production. They came from pigs or they came from chickens. This is where these viruses were, were bred, these zoonotic diseases. And so these large industrial scale factory farms and slaughterhouses, they are perfect for incubators of these very dangerous viruses um, that can get unleashed very easily. Um, so if, if you ever hear someone say in a very racist way, all oh, these wet markets out there, there, we should shut them down. You should let them know we should be shutting down all these large scale, all these, these ways in which we dominate uh, animals because it, it almost always leads to uh, a mutual misery uh, when we have an outbreak, when we have a pandemic. So this is also thinking zoopolitically, right? Seeing the connections between human society and nature and the ways in which we should or should not be interacting with, uh, with, with other beings on, on this planet. Okay, so that was a lot. Uh, and I hope that helped with, uh, with, the, um, uh, with the reading of the, of the essay. Now we're just going to finish with a few other examples from, from contemporary art that I find interesting that sort of fit this paradigm of Zupolis that we've been establishing in, from Mulch's essay. So one is by Martin Roth, who was a dear friend of mine. I mean, you already, you've already seen a work of his. Uh, you'll remember the Swan Lake and the mouse in the, in the terrarium. This is a, 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 one, of his, one, of his, one of his earlier works, um, and it's called In March 2013, I Created a Natural Landscape for My Bonsai. And so you would walk into a gallery, and you would see these two speakers and a little bonsai. Um, and I like how this echoes the, the Tokyo Waka film, um, because the bonsai tree, of course, is uniquely uh, Japanese. And it's, it's very specific because the bonsai tree is almost like both a natural thing and a cultural thing. Right? These, these are, these are uh, pruned and, and shaped in such ways that um, they're almost like natural and cultural. Um, and so you would walk in and you would see this, very bare, very minimal. And you would hear natural sounds coming through the speakers. And when you walk into the gallery, you'd assume that this bonsai tree is on its own and that this is just like a pre-recorded uh, tape of nature or something like that, a re-recording -re audio of nature. But if you went down into the basement of this gallery, you would then see this. And you would see aquariums and cages uh, filled with all this wildlife, birds, fish, crickets, grasshoppers, all these different um, these different creatures, all of them miked, and then you realize that upstairs, this little bonsai tree is being fed by actual living entities, right? Uh, so this is very zoopolitical in a way because he's forcing you to realize that there's all this, there are all these creatures that are almost like invisible, they're almost like off in the margins, you don't really see them until you, you can actually go down and pay attention to them. Uh, forcing you to realize that all this stuff around us actually is this whole world, this whole zoopolis, right? Um, and I have, a, there's a video of it um, that, that I can show you. It's short. So this is the sound you would have, that would have been bathing the, bathing the bonsai tree in, uh, in this ambient sound with all these wonderful creatures.
we talk about re-enchanting the, the cityscape, or in this case, re-enchanting the gallery, these beautiful sounds. There's a reason why people seek out natural sounds like this. Um, even when, you know, when they fall asleep, they have these ambient apps that play them nature, right? Um, there is something about the, these, these, these ecosystems and these creatures that make noise that are very soothing uh, and nice for us, right? Uh, and so this is a form of, of re-enchantment. It was also very important for the artist. He also said, he always said that um, any, any, any animals that he works with that he uses in his work, they always end up in a, either out in the wild, if they can be rewilded, or in a sanctuary. Um, so they're not simply being used um, and then discarded. Um, they, the, the work almost becomes like a transit station for them to a, a, you know, a different stage in their life. So that's also really important to think of in the zoopolitical, contextual way. Um, we also have a photographer like Catherine Chalmers, and I'm sorry for anybody who's scared of cockroaches, uh, but she works a lot with cockroaches. Uh, talk about a, a creature that lives really well with us. Um, I mean, they thrive in cities, uh, and they're going to be here longer, way longer uh, than we, than our species will ever be. Um, they can survive just about anything. Um, so what she does, she works with cockroaches, and she'll actually try to make them more, um, I don't know what you think of this, but she, she tries to make them a little more approachable, less things that we were revolted by, and she tries to sort of re-encode them to be kind of beautiful, to look like, you know, uh, a, a pretty, a cute insect or something like that rather than this insect that most people uh, loathe, right? So that's also a, a way to think zoopolitically. Whenever I see a cockroach in my apartment, I always set him loose or her loose or it loose. I'm not sure if we, we gender cockroaches, uh, but I've read Kafka, uh, The Metamorphosis, so I always think that, uh, that uh, um, this little bug maybe has more going on than, than we know. Uh, so one last example for you. Um, this is really interesting stuff. There's a whole <clears throat> uh, organization called the Expanded Environment that works with designers, uh, urban planners, and architects. So we're moving uh, kind of away from artists here, and we're, we're moving more towards like urban planners, um, urban theorists, and architects, and designers, and that sort of thing. And this is exactly what Walsh is talking about. So the the the, the, the plans that you can find on this website, and you can you can look it up, there are all sorts of them, there are all sorts of projects, design and architecture projects. They all, in some way, shape, or form, uh, de-anthropocentrize, uh, have, a, have a de anthropocentric conception of their practice. So design and city, city, um, um, city building, uh, architecture, no longer is it just, well, how are humans gonna fit in this, but it's how are humans and the non-humans that are a part of our world, how they're also going to fit in with, with, with this. So there are all sorts of really wonderful projects, um, one of which would be this uh, ecosystem, ambient shelters for avifauna, uh, flying fauna, like birds in, in the cities. And this is interesting because uh, birds uh, will be disrupted by sound, just like in the ocean. Uh, ocean noise is terrible for cetaceans, terrible for whales, because they communicate along long, um, um, expansive spaces through sound, um, through their, through their, their, uh, their song. Um, it's the same thing with birds. Birds, uh, it's important for birds to be able to navigate and to have songs uh, and to be able to have like a, this, this ecosystem, this, this shelter, this ambient shelter. And so it's a, it's a way of imagining the city to have spaces that are almost like sonic sanctuaries for, um, for, 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 for birds. Um, and birds are especially in danger in, in cities, especially with these uh, you know, like these skyscrapers that are sheets of glass that look like mirrors. So many birds every year are killed by running into those those um, those um, skyscrapers because they look like it's just the the sky, right? Or it can be mistaken as as the sky. Um, and so that type of architecture is definitely not taking into consideration the avifauna in our cities um, and the birds that that live with us in this urban ecosystem. Um, there are other uh, proposals which are interesting that haven't been made. Uh, knowing the Synanthrope, which is proposed by this um, this designer named Sarah Gunawan. Um, so all these denizens of our cities that we talked about before, uh, they, are, uh, they should be thought as synanthropic, is what she calls it, um, that there are these animals that are both, they, they really mingle uh, they're not purely domestic and they're not totally wild. 
Um, they're non-humans that are part of our space, right? And so she wants to reimagine um, urban planning and design along these lines. And so she has all these designs that would create spaces for um, for, for these animals to live uh, more seamlessly within our shared urban environment. Um, and she also proposes a, this other project called Sin Urban Assemblages because we've been talking largely about the city, but what about the suburbs? The suburbs which are much closer to the so-called natural, uh, you know, rural world, right? Um, there's a, uh, there's, there's a way in which suburbs are terrible um, for wildlife that lives there because it's all regimented, it's all uh, grid-like, it's really made to be accessible for cars and for humans, right? But what about all the, the, the non-humans that have natural migratory patterns that go through these spaces, which have now been plunked down with these residential uh, lots? Some of them are very large in the suburbs. So her idea is to... Um, um, to not only uh, make additions to houses that will that will uh, have spaces for like birds and that sort of thing, uh, but also to think of movement corridors within the within the the, uh, the suburban space. So spaces that are left open for non-humans to, to to facilitate their natural movements within within the space. And even bigger than this, um, large space. Uh, uh, animal movement corridors for animals that migrate, um, animals that that run through the spaces in which we happen to also live. So these animal ecological systems that are left, that are left, um, that are left open for uh, for these non-humans to navigate. And again, this also sounds utopian, but um, if you if you've ever lived in Europe, if you know uh, certain parts of Europe, like in Germany, but I've seen it also in France, this happens. Uh, th th this is already being done. The idea that uh, the, our city planning um, should involve a consideration for the ways in which animals move. In Germany, it's not, it's not rare to see an overpass on a highway that's simply an op overpass of greenage so that animals can, instead of having to perilously cross the highway, they can go through these corridors and they go over the highway um, in these wilded, uh, overpasses, right? I live in upstate uh, right now, and it's about a two-hour drive up. I can't tell you how many times, it's, it's horrible, how many times you see a deer that's been hit by a truck or by a car, and its body is just like uh, just violently eviscerated uh, onto, onto the, uh, on, on the road. Uh, these are the things that we might want to uh, consider somehow dealing with, that there may be ways in which rather than just thinking of a highway as simply this place for cars and humans, that we should think of building highways to mitigate um, all this, all this uh, carnage um, that, that's represented by roadkill, uh, which is, again, other places in the world have started to think about this. So um, that's our last example. So I hope you found this interesting. Um, now go on and read Walsh's essay. I understand it's a difficult essay, so if you can't understand every part of it, if some parts you skip because it's just not really registering, don't worry about it. Just do the best you can. Um, and if you've understood and if, if this lecture resonates with you, um, we've, we've gone a long way in understanding her concept um, and thinking through some of these ideas. So, okay, until the next session. Take care. Take care, everybody.